الحمد لله الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد قال الله تعالى في القرآن المجيد والفرقان الحميد بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا صدق الله العظيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم افتح علينا حكمتك وانشر علينا أنا رحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا رب صل وسلم دائما أبدا على حبيبك خير الخلق كلهم اللهم صل على محمد وفهمني بأسرار القرآن أنب العلماء Brothers and sisters listening at home Alhamdulillah Today is our 29th session of doing the dars of the Quran Kareem and inshallah from tonight, every Thursday, we'll be restarting the dars of the Qur'an. And inshallah, the dars of the, of the Qur'an, the duration will be 30 minutes. So 20 to 30 minutes. This is so that if any brothers, this is just to accommodate those brothers who might want to go home early. So by, 20, by 8.20 or 8.30, 8:30, we will finish every Thursday. So this is the timing for Thursday uh, after Isha. There is a Quran, inshallah. So the surah, if you all remember, we did as a Musa alayhi salam and Khizr and some say as a Khazir alayhi salatu was salam story. For the next couple of weeks or maybe for the next couple of months, I don't know, inshallah we'll be going through a surah which is the most powerful, one of the most powerful surah in the Holy Qur'an. Its power is such, the surah's power is such, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Prophet, Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, there is no fitna, there is no challenge which this ummah will face, or any ummah will have faced, which is greater than the challenge and the fitna of Dajjal. From the time of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam till now, until the day of judgment, this ummah has gone through many challenges. But let's take a moment that what does this statement actually mean? That no challenge, no fitna has been greater than the fitna of Dajjal when he will come. This ummah from the time of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam has gone through so many fitnas, so many challenges. To such an extent, some challenges and some decline and some fitna which has occurred on this ummah was such that scholars at that time had actually written books and, had, and there was this, uh, this notion that maybe Qiyamah is coming now. That's how decline and that's how the fitna were during the 12th century, 13th century, the decline of this ummah. But Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying that more than the challenge which they faced, this Challenge is far greater than any challenge. You know, if you just look at the, the Mongols when uh, Genghis Khan, okay, in the, 12th, in the 13th century, his, his son Halagu Khan, they destroyed Baghdad. 1.6 million Herat, 1.4 million Nishapur, 1.6 million people were massacred. Women were massacred. Five centuries of knowledge. Baghdad was the capital. Baghdad, and it was an, an epicenter, it was, a, it was a center point for Islamic knowledge from the time of 762 when Al-Mansur became the Khalif till 1152. Five, for approximately four to five hundred years, Baghdad, okay, this, is, these, this place was a place where thinkers, where ulama, where all these great pious people came to learn knowledge. And they wrote so many books. But within two or three weeks, when Halagu Khan, when the Genghis people came, five centuries of knowledge was wiped out. The river of Euphrates, the river of Tigris, they say, was flowing with red blood. It was at this time when people actually thought that Islam is going to ex extinguish now. There's no way someone or Muslims will be able to fight this army. Because he was doing advancement from, obviously, from the eastern side. And he came all the way to Baghdad. And he had Egypt left, he had Syria left. 
and other two, three Islamic countries. And there was this notion that that's it. This is the time when Islam is going to wipe, get wiped out. But look at the Qudrat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, that same army, that, that same people, the, the Mongols, Genghis Khan's grandson, Berki, Berki Khan, he became Muslim. And through that, Islam then flourished. So if you look at history, there's always been decline. And after decline, there's always been rise. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works. I remember when I was a student, our Hazrat Hafizab used to tell us often that if you want to read history, the decline and the rise, okay, then read the book Tariqa Da'watu Azimat. Tariqa Da'watu Azimat, which is written by Mawlana Abul Hassan Ali Nadwi Rahmatullahi Alayhi. It's in five volumes, okay, but the book illustrates that whenever decline has come, then how has Islam risen? Which individual were there? And what did they do in that time to get Islam back to its highest position? Mu'ala Abul Hassan Ali Nidwi Rahmatullahi Ali wrote, this was actually a lecture which he did, and this was then trans- transcribed into a book, Tariqa Dawato Azimat. And then someone in 1986, 1970 to 1986, someone translated this whole book into English. Well, because the English was really hard, okay, no one actually used to read that book because it was uh, the English which we are familiar with. Then Alhamdulillah, uh, Maulana Mufti Abdul Rahman Mangira Sahab, Mufti Abdul Rahman Mangira Sahab, he revised this book and he edited this book so that it becomes easy for you and me to read. So this book is called the Saviors of Islamic Spirit. So this is the book in front of me. Saviors of Islamic Spirit. And in here he has written the, the biography of, not just the biography, but when decline came, how Islam was revived. In the time of Hassan al-Basri, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Abdul Qadir Jilani, at the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, at the time of Abu Hassan al-Ashari, at the time of Izzuddin Abdul Salam, at the time of Imam Jawzi, at the time of Imam Ghazali, Imam Salahuddin Ayyubi, Nuruddin Zanghi. Before these, okay, Islam was going and these people, they revived Islam. And how did they revive? What methodology did, did they use? So this book, Saviors of Islam, Islamic Spirit, is a really good book. And Mufti Abdul Rahman Mangira, we are very fortunate that inshallah on Saturday, this Saturday, Mufti Abdul Rahman Mangira will be coming here and he'll be delivering a speech in this same masjid. So brothers are requested that we participate and come to listen to Sheikh Abdul Rahman Mangira's lecture. So as I was saying, saviors is, it's called Saviors of, Islam, of Islamic Spirit. That's the translation which they did of Tariqa Dawato Azimat. So if anyone is interested, it's a really good book to read. So like I was saying, every time decline came, and then Islam has risen. When Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that you put every challenge which this ummah, all the previous ummah had faced, and the challenge of Dajjal and the fitna of Dajjal when he will come is going to be far greater than any fitna. This is why Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that every prophet who came onto this earth they warned their people. Every prophet warned their people about Dajjal. And the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself said that I am also warning you. And then one day he stated that I am going to tell you a few things extra which other prophets did not mention. And he said, Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that this Dajjal, when he will come, he will be one-eyed. وَإِنَّ رَبَّكُمْ لَيْسَ بِأَعْوَرُ And remember, your Lord, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is not one-eyed. And then Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave such a descriptive description of this person, how he will look like. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said he'll be short. He'll have thick, curly, black hair. His forehead will be wide. He'll have two... When I was young, okay, I used to think when people would say that he's one-eyed, maybe he, okay, that maybe he's got one eye in the middle, but no, he's, he's, he has got two eyes, but one eye is blinded, and he can only see from the other eye. So that's how it is. Not one eye in the middle, two eyes, but one eye. Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi wasallam said it's like protruding grape, a grape which has come out. That's how it look, look like. He'll be reddish in complexion. His chest will be broad. 
and when he will be walking, he will be walking with one leg crookedness. This is the description which Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wasallam gave of Dajjal. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that he will come from the eastern side and he will have 70,000 followers. And wherever he will go, wherever he will go, he will destroy. And you know, nowadays, unfortunately, when one person becomes murdered, when one person leaves Islam, we feel the pain. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, and he comes in Kitab, that in that time, thousands of people will start believing in him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us. They will believe him as a Messiah, and then they will believe him as a Lord. And what he will do, okay, he will, because at that time, there will be famine. So Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, when, before the Dajjal will come, three years prior, okay, two-thirds of rain will be stopped. Then one-third, then two-third, then the year he will emerge, there will be no rain. So there will be famine, there will be no crops, there will be no food. So wherever he will be going, okay, he will be enticing people to give food. And whoever believes in, in him, okay, they will become disbelievers. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from this great fitna. The question arises is whether is he alive or not? Okay, there are a couple of things where ulamas have differed. Some ulama have said that he will, he, he is not, he, meaning he will be born. Some scholars have said, no, he, he is alive. Even now he is alive somewhere. And the, the proof which they give is the hadith of Tamim Dari. Nabi Kareem Asma bin Taqayas radiallahu ta'ala anha says that we were in our house when we heard someone saying as-salat uh, al-jami'ah uh, 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 meaning to come for salah there's azan but in them days if you wanted to call it a, a gathering to masjid okay, you'd say uh, I think as-salat uh, al-jami'ah something like that Okay, so this meant that Nabi Kareem Sallallahu is calling people towards the masjid not for praying salah, but there's a message which he wants to deliver. So Asma bin Taqay says that I heard this caller saying this, okay, inviting everyone to come to the masjid. And we all went to the masjid, the ladies and the men. So the men were at the front, and Asma bin Taqay says I was at the back, but in the front row, meaning where the women were, were sitting, I was in the front row. And then she said that Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I stood on a member and he said the hadith of Dajjal. And he said that today I want to mention to you something which Tamim Adari, Tamim Adari was a person who became Muslim. He became Muslim. But before he became Muslim, he had experienced something. And he shared that with Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So when he shared that with Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to share that experience which Tamim Adari had with the Sahabas. So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Tamim Adari, when before he became Muslim, he experienced this and he's told me this. And this is what I'm telling you. That w before he became Muslim, Tamim Adari with 30 people. And the hadith is long where uh, they were uh, uh, on a ship or on a boat. They got lost and they came on, onto an island and they met this beast or this person who was so hairy. And this person or this beast said to Tamim Adari and others, that there's someone uh, calling you. And then we went there, and then we saw this person all shackled. And Tamim Adari and others, uh, this person then said, that has the Prophet arrived, and he asked, he asked a few questions. And then he said, that I am Dajjal. So when Nabi Karim Sassam was mentioning this to the Sahabas, he was saying to the Sahabas, didn't I tell you about Dajjal? I looked at him. So because of this, some... Scholars have mentioned that he is alive. We don't know where. But when the time will come, he will emerge. And the other difference which ulama have is, you know, the hadith uh, we read and the narration that during that time near the Qiyamah, people will be using sword, people will be using spear. Okay, technology will be gone. So some scholars have said that, is it actually that people will be fighting with sword, spears, meaning the technology will, will have gone and we'll be back to our ancient times. So some scholars have said yes, this is what it means. But some scholars have mentioned no. Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa because at that time to make people understand about all this technology was 
beyond the comprehension. So Nabi Akadim Sassa mentioned about sword, about spears, and he gave descriptions which, if you look at it from today's age, would make us realize that maybe he was describing the things which are to do with technology. So for example, Nabi, so scholars have mentioned that Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa said that Dajjal will be riding on a donkey. On a donkey. But the, the, the ears of the two donkey, the distance between one ear to the other ear will be 40 cubit. 40 cubit is about 18 meters. So some scholars have mentioned that maybe this means uh, uh, jet fighters. Because if you measure from one wing to another wing, there's about 20 to 30 meters. Okay, and that's how it looks like. So maybe the description which Nabi Akhenson was giving, maybe that, that was a metaphor explaining a jet fighter. Another example is Nabi Akhenson said, at that time, when birds will be flying, they will drop dead. All of a sudden. So some scholars have mentioned, maybe this means, okay, that obviously there, when there's nuclear war, when there's all this happening, what happens to the bird? Because of radiation, because of the effect, they just drop dead. So maybe Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was either explaining that people go back in its time, or he was explaining in a metaphor how things will be at that time. So this, which Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned to us, is the greatest fitna ever to come on this earth. This is why we should always make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he saves us from the fitna of Dajjal. Because if he's not going to come in, in, in our lifetime, then in our children's lifetime. If not in their lifetime, then in our grandchildren's lifetime. So that's the greatest fitna ever to come on this earth. And may, you know, may a million and a billion durud be upon Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at that time said that this fitna, when he will come, his fitna will be such that he comes in Abu Dawood that it was the advice of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that do not face him. Do not try to be, you know, the cool person that I'll face him and challenge him. No. Run away from him. When you will see him, run away from him. Because he will be able to travel, okay, around the countries, across the globe. In 40 days, okay, Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that one day will be like one year, another day will be like a month, another day will be like a week, and then the rest, normal. He will be able to travel everywhere, every city, every town, except for two, Makkah al-Mukarramah and Madina al-Munawwara. So Nabi Karim said that if you see him, run away from him. Don't challenge him. Nabi Karim said that there, there is only one person, there is only one person who could have challenged this person. And Prophet said, that's me. If he comes in my lifetime, then I am enough. I am sufficient to, uh, 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 I am, uh, meaning I am enough to tackle him. But if he comes after me, then there is no way, there is no one in this, on the face of this earth who will be able to challenge him. There is only one way and there is only one person who will be able to challenge him. And even he will have to come from the skies onto the earth and that is Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. But Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us, and this is his rahmah, okay, that there is something, there is a surah in the Quran. That if you recite that surah every Friday, then if Dajjal appears when you are alive, then because of the power of this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will save you. And that is the recitation of Surah Al Kahf which we'll be doing in the next couple of weeks and months, every Friday. Surah Al-Kahf is in 15 farah. It's about half a, half a para, okay, which takes about 10 to 15 minutes to recite. So it comes in Hadith Sharif, and scholars have mentioned that a person who recites Surah Al-Kahf every Friday, every Friday, he'll be protected from the fitna of Dajjal. Now, I'd like to also men mention this, that there might be some brothers and sisters listening at home who might, because of their busy schedule, okay, they don't read Surah Al-Kahf. Then the least we can do, the least we can do, Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala mentions this hadith, that this is the least we should be able to do it. That memorize, memorize 
the Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that whoever memorizes the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf, whoever memorizes the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf, he will be protected from Dajjal. And that's so easy to, for everyone to do. So let's take some time out. And this is the message which I'm going to share here and to those who are at home. That if you haven't memorized, there's 10 verses, it's 14 lines, okay, here in, in the Quran. And it's easy. If we put our head to it, then inshallah we'll be able to memorize the 14 verses. Before I conclude, I'll just mention something, and inshallah we'll carry on next week. Is there might be people here who might want to memorize. Okay, they might have the shock, the zeal. You know what? Let's memorize the first 10 uh, verse. There might be some ladies at home who wants to memorize this. Then I'll just give you some tips on memorization. Okay? And those who are in HIFS class, okay, if any parents are listening, then this is a methodology which can be used by a, a student as well to learn sabak. And this method is probably one of the easiest methods of learning or memorizing anything. So what do you do? Okay, so for example, first 10 verses. If you say to yourself that, for example, today or tomorrow, I'm going to learn three lines or four lines, for example. Okay, I'm not going to learn all 10 lines in one day. I'm going to break you up four, four, four lines or three, three lines. So inshallah, by next week, I should have memorized the first 10 verses. So what you do, is whatever you're going to memorize, whatever you're going to memorize, three verse or four verse, keep on reading that. Get familiar with the words. So keep on reading the, for example, let's say for five sentences, someone says, I'm going to memorize five sentences. So keep on re reciting that five sentences. If you're a Hafiz and you're, be, and you're a student, you're becoming Hafiz, the night time before going to sleep, keep on, become familiar with the words and with the sentence. So those who are in Hibs class, I mentioned this to them, okay? Become, becoming familiar is very important. So I know uh, there's elders here, but when I'm teaching children who are in Hibs class, I tell them, that I'll give an example. There's a, if someone supports a particular team, okay? That particular, a, a Premier League team, for example, what's the chance of them Meaning the chances of them winning, of that team winning, is it more when they're home or when they're away? Home. But the question comes, why home? The pitch are all the same. Meaning 105 by 68 meters. It's not like you're going to go somewhere else. And yes, some people might say because of the fans. But what's the other reason? Because you're familiar. When you're familiar with something, okay, it, the natural inc inclination is that uh, you become content. This is why some scholars have mentioned, this is very beautiful. Now why does Allah SWT actually describe Jannah to us? He has already said that Jannah is something which you can't think of, which you can't even, uh, which no ears have ever heard. But why, then why does Allah SWT describe Jannah? Because He wants us to become familiar with Jannah. So when we enter Jannah, it won't be like, like it's, yeah, it will be completely different. But he wants us to become... So, again, going back, when you're becoming Hafiz, or you want to learn these 10 verses, become familiar. Then the next day, okay, after you become familiar with the words, next day, okay, you use the, 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 the blockchain method. Blockchain method is, okay, so for example, if, if someone wants to memorize this, you learn one block, and then the next block. And then you connect the both blocks. So, for example, Alhamdulillah okay, Alhamdulillah You think... You, you make that into one, one block. If you are struggling, then Alhamdulillah. But for this example, let's use Alhamdulillah Ladi. Alhamdulillah Ladi. Alhamdulillah Ladi. Alhamdulillah Ladi. Alhamdulillah Ladi. Until you're confident enough that you've memorized Alhamdulillah Ladi and you can read this without looking inside Alhamdulillah Ladi. Then, for example, ala, uh, anzala ala abdi al kitab. If that's too much, then maybe just anzala. Anzala, anzala. Or anzala ala, anzala ala, anzala ala. When you become confident that you memorize that, then you you chain them two up. Then you read Alhamdulillah Ladi Anzala Ala. Alhamdulillah Ladi Anzala Ala. Alhamdulillah Ladi Anzala Ala. Alhamdulillah. Then once you're confident that you know that, 
that's become your your one block now. There were two blocks, it's become one block. Then ala abdihil kitaba, ala abdihil kitaba, ala abdihil kitaba, ala abdihil kitaba, ala ab. Once you're confident enough that you've memorized ala abdihil kitaba so many times, then you join the, the block one with this alhamdulillah illadi anzala ala abdihil kitaba, alhamdulillah illadi anzala ala abdihil kitaba. And you keep on reciting this until, you're, until you've memorized this. And then you keep on, and then once you've learned the whole sentence, then that becomes your one block. Then you go to the next block. You do the, exactly the same. And then you, you join the first sentence with the second sentence. And then you do it with the third. And then you join the th first, second, third. So this is one way of memorizing. So the thing which I wanted brothers here and sisters at home to take is, let's, if, if you haven't memorized, then from today, inshallah, make this intention that we are going to memorize. And the best time to memorize is in the morning. Remember this. Even those who are becoming hafiz, Morning is the best time because, for example, if I take my phone out, okay, I'm sure I'll be on 25%, 20%. Why? Because the body's been used, been used, been used. Before I go to sleep, I'll have to pray on charge. Similarly, all day our body has been used, used, used. All the energy has been used. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept sleep to regain all the energy back. So when we wake up, our battery is at 100%. And then when our battery is 100%, if we just waste that, doing something on screen, doing petty things, then when, you, when your energy level, when your memory level was at its peak, why did you utilize it at that time? You need to, okay? So they say that, for example, if you spend one hour night time memorizing, that's equivalent to 10 minutes in the morning. The amount of things you'll be able to learn in 10 minutes in the morning will be like half an hour, one hour in the evening. Why? Because you're exerting so much effort. So, these were some uh, some advice with those people who want to memorize. So, inshallah, so like I said, this is one of the strongest sunnah. One question which does come is, why? there are many other surahs as well, which are very powerful. Surah Yasin, the heart of the Qur'an. Ayat al-Kursi, okay, so strong. But why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose Surah Al-Kahf to be that one surah which will protect a person from the jail? It wasn't ad hoc. It wasn't, look, it wasn't that Allah subhanahu wa just chose any surah. Everything which is written in the Quran, there's a reason for it. So scholars have mentioned that why, what's the relationship between the jail coming and this surah? And why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose this surah to be that surah which will protect a person from Dajjal? And inshallah that will, I will mention next week inshallah. So inshallah from next week after Isha Salah for 20 to 30 minutes we'll be doing the dars of Surah Al-Kahf. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first give me the tawfiq, the rest of us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save us from the fitna of Dajjal. After every salah, we should be reciting and we should be making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he saves us from the fitna of Dajjal. And because it's also Friday night, Islamically, so brothers are requested and sisters at home that we spend our time in reciting the Sharif upon Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah, wa bihamdi, subhanakallah, wa bihamdi, wa ilaha illa,